Remember, remind me. I record these sessions. Uh, the reason being is uh, that way everybody can look at it. So if you do not want your image to appear in the videos, please turn your, your video off. So it's just got a blank screen. Okay, most of, most of it will just be the presenter, but we don't want you on there if you don't want to be. Um, it's your choice, okay? Um, other than that, I don't have a lot to say at the moment. Uh, we are planning a, a series of meetings, uh, marketing meetings, so on Thursdays at 1, 1 p.m. And you can look at our calendar on the BC Federation website, and it will tell you what the subject is for that week. Okay? Now, Square Up BC is the marketing initiative of the BC Square and Round Dance Federation. And I would like to introduce you to our chairperson, Brian Elmer. Brian? Hello to everyone, and uh, thanks sincerely for participating in our Zoom session today. Um, anticipation is that our social recreations are poised to see substantial interest after the pandemic. Um, and it's because people have been socially starved in a, avoidance of COVID-19, and our dance forms are ideal for a return to social interaction. And now our, our British Columbia Square and Round Dance Federation embraces uh, square dancing, round dancing, clog dancing, and contra, and we have member uh, clubs in each of those dance forms. Um, so in readiness to prepare for what uh, might just be a groundswell of interest uh, at all levels of organization from club to regional association to federation and the Canadian society, we need to learn how to mar market properly the dance instruction that we're selling. And this Zoom platform is certainly a, a really useful way to explore that. Um, regarding today's session, it was on February 13th that the United Square Dancers of America organization USD, USDA for short, uh, presented our special guest, Mike Hogan, in a Zoom marketing session. Uh, having participated in that and being so impressed with his presentation, I asked Mike to do not just one, but two sessions with us uh, today and again on Sunday. So I know, Mike, that you will tell your audience about yourself. So let me turn this session over to you now and I have to say with great appreciation for uh, your, your participation. Thanks. Well, you're welcome, Brian. And, and I appreciate you reaching out to me. Um, I've actually was looking through all of the faces and names and I think there's a lot of you who are new friends to me today. I, I, how many of you, I know your mic, your, never mind, your mics are on mute, you can't raise your hand, but I'm just wondering how many of you have danced to me at some point or another. I know uh, it's British Columbia, so you're you're clear up northwest, uh, and I haven't been in the northwest part of, of the United States very often. I've been uh, I've been into uh, uh, Oregon, and I had a trip to Washington that got canceled thanks to COVID. Um, so I don't know how many of you know me or know much about me. I'm going to share my presentation. I don't usually talk a lot about me but I wanted you to get an idea of my background so that you know enough about me, I guess, to go, you know, does this guy actually know what he's talking about or is he full of beans? So I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, let's see. All right, somebody let me know you can see my screen. I can see it, Mike, Got no it? problem. Okay. All right. So um, again, thank you for asking me to, to join you today. Um, I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions at the end. I have as much time as you need. Um, this is gonna take a little while. How long, how long do we have slated for this, by the way? As long as you need. I didn't put any. I didn't put any specific time. All right. Well, I'll try to. I'll try to hustle because I could talk to you for hours. I've done sessions <laughs> like this that have actually been a full weekend marketing training. Obviously, much bigger deep dive than this. But so here's here's uh, here's me. So I'm Mike Hogan. I'm a square dance caller. Uh, I just celebrated square dance calling for 45 years. 
I started at the ripe old age of 13. So I've been at it a long time. Um, I don't know if maybe I should say 44 since COVID just about took a whole year out, but uh, we'll go with 45. Uh, I'm currently the vice chairman of Collar Lab. I've been a Collar Lab Board of Governor member for eight or nine years, something like that. I travel extensively as a caller throughout the United States. I've called in something like 36 states so far. Uh, and I think part of this that I think is really relevant is that I've called for the same local club here in Omaha for 42 years. So I've got a lot of history with square dancing. Um, we have lots of marketers. We have lots of square dancers. I just happen to be in the position in my real career where I know a lot about marketing. So um, here's my marketing resume. So I've got 30 years in the marketing industry. Uh, through that time frame, I've been a business manager and controller. So I know a lot about money, uh, I guess. Uh, I've been an account executive, a general sales manager, and a station manager. Um, for a brief period, I left the, the, uh, the radio, television, et cetera side and managed a couple of advertising, full service advertising agencies, uh, one called Rutledge Integrated Marketing and then Square One Digital Marketing Services. So that would have been uh, in 2012. A lot has changed in the digital world by leaps and bounds from 2012, um, but that's okay. I got back into the, uh, into the other side of it, if you will. Uh, I've worked for iHeartMedia, which is North America's largest audio company reaching 275 million listeners every month. Uh, that's just the broadcast side. And I currently serve as the market president for our Sioux City, Iowa operations. So I have five radio stations here that I manage along with all of the digital marketing uh, elements, all of that that goes along with it. So that's kind of my background. I just have the chance to take what I do for a real living, if you will, and apply it the best that I can to help my, my real passion, other than my wife and children, which is square dancing. So hopefully that gives you enough background to know that I kind of have an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, there's my iHeart logo, yay. Okay, so just a couple things to start out with. Um, so problem well stated is half solved, Charles Kettering. So I wanna talk about leadership. Um, leadership, is critical and I know that you folks are on this today because you you know kind of raised your hand and taken on the responsibility of leadership so who's really in charge and this is relative to square dancing who has the vision for our future who gets to make the important decisions uh, a leader recognizes challenges and makes decisions to to uh, attack those challenges to put our business in a better place and then who has the authority to act and solve those challenges? So today, I'm gonna to ask everybody on the call to take a new role. I know you're square dancers. Some of you may be cloggers. Some of you may be uh, some other dance form related. But right now I want you to take on the role of president of square dancing, meaning that it's your business and it has to succeed. And if it doesn't, your livelihood is completely relevant on the success of the business. So if you won't be able to make your mortgage payment this month, if this business is not successful, that kind of changes the role for most of you, because most of you, I know there's probably some callers and cures that are on here as well, but most of you participate in this activity because it's a hobby that you love. And we've made a lot of decisions based on the hobby that we love, but not from viewing it from a business standpoint. So that's kind of part of what I'm going to hopefully bring uh, to bear today for you. Okay, so how's our business doing? Demand is down. I think we all would agree. On, and most of this is pre-COVID without even considering pro, uh, COVID. Demand is down. We don't have near the crowds that we used to have. Our customer base is unable to dance as often as they used to. Declining dancer population due to health reasons and age. Um, uh, dance venues, where are we dancing? Dance venue, venues are expensive. Callers and cures are expensive. Um, we have a declining caller and cure population. So we have a reduction in the amount of talent and 
in, in the beginner state, the amount of talent relative to teachers. So we're dealing with that issue, okay? Dancers don't want to hold office. You all are not part of that group. You're here because you want to learn more. You want to help the activity. But you all know how tough it is to get someone to run for president or secretary or treasurer of your local clubs or your local dance organization. So dancers don't want to hold office. We're having trouble getting anybody to take lessons. And then we can't get a, lar a large enough crowd nowadays to pay our bills. Bottom line is there aren't enough of you. We need more of you, the current dancers. The more dancers we have, the more, that's where our callers come from. You know, we don't get somebody off the street that doesn't square dance and turn them into a caller. They have to become a dancer first. So that's our biggest problem. There aren't enough of you, the current dancers. And now we have a new problem, COVID-19. So here's what we know about COVID and what it's done to us. It shut your business down. But now remember, take this as the idea that your, this is your business. This is how you pay your bills. So think of a restaurant that's been closed since COVID came out. You're in that same predicament. The business has been shut down because of COVID. But what we don't know is when are we gonna be able to reopen? How many of our customers are gonna come back once we reopen? And also the talent that we have, how many, how much talent are we going to lose and how many will be available when they come back? We don't know the answers to these questions, but we do see the business reopening soon. We don't know the exact date on the calendar, but it's coming. Um, I'm not up to speed on the statistics of the vaccines and how they're getting distributed across Canada. Uh, but I do know that at least in Iowa where I work, everyone is supposed to be available to get the vaccine after the 1st of April. So it is right around the corner. Okay, so now let's talk about marketing. So a lot of times I'm asked uh, a lot about tactics, things like running television ads, radio ads, Facebook, all of those kinds of things. I wanna talk about marketing to you in a bigger scale because the, that piece of it, is the, the promotion part, is just one piece of marketing. So promotions are, set, are a set of activities that communicate the product and the brand or the services that we offer to the user or the intended user. So the goal of a promotion is to increase awareness, create interest, generate sales, and then ultimately create brand loyalty. But promotions is just one of the elements of a marketing plan. The marketing plan includes product, price, place, and promotion. Um, there's a lot of info. I'm going to refer to the, the Caller Lab Square Dance Marketing Manual uh, several times throughout this. There is uh, a lot more information about each of these pieces uh, contained in the first part of that marketing manual. So let's talk about our consumer. And this is true for you guys too. We all want to buy a product or a service for only one of two reasons. And it sounds more complicated than that, but it really isn't. There's only two reasons that we purchase something. We either want it or we need it, one or the other. Uh, I had a, a heating air conditioning contractor come in and replace a furnace here in our offices uh, in early winter. I didn't want to buy a new furnace. I needed it, had to have it. Uh, on the other hand, if I bought, I almost just got really close to buying a camper this last weekend. I don't know how many of you camp, but we don't need to camp. We want to camp. Um, so that's an example. And sometimes it's a little combination of the two. And my example for that is transportation. I drive a 2017 Buick LaCrosse. It's the largest car that Buick makes. It's a luxury sedan. Um, if I what I needed was transportation. I got to get from A to B. What I wanted was a car that was bigger, heavier, safer, comfortable to ride. I wanted bells and whistles, all of those kinds of things. So the car that I'm driving is a little bit of a combination between a need that I have to have for transportation and what I want my transportation to be like. But that's it, want or need. So if we don't have people lining up to take square dance lessons from us. It's because 
they either don't want it, they haven't recognized and they don't want it, or they haven't connected it with a need. So they got to connect what we do with something they want or something they need. If they can't make that connection, they are not going to take classes from us. So here's what most dancers that in my experience, and I've worked with a lot of dancers uh, over the last probably 12 to 15 years, um, I want to talk about the marketing funnel. Some people will call it the sales funnel, but basically there's a process that we take anybody through uh, before they make a purchase and then eventually become advocates of our activity. All of you are advocates. You're addicted. I get it. But for most people and most businesses, it starts with awareness. That is the foundation of any kind of business cycle. You've got to get people, first of all, to be aware. So we do recruiting. We put ads in the newspaper for lessons. We distribute flyers. Uh, we email a friend. There's a lot of different things that we do. Um, but the problem with that is that recruiting is the bottom part of the marketing funnel. Imagine that I wanted you, wanted you to buy Let me think of something. I use this sometimes in, in some of my examples. Um, oh gosh, I'm sorry. I can't think. I can't think of what it is. Uh, it'll come back to me. It's when I don't need it. Uh, but the point here is, when you ask somebody to take lessons, you're at the point where you're asking them to make a purchase. And the problem with that is, if they if they don't know that square dancing exists, if they haven't associated square dancing with a want or a need all of that kind of thing, you're asking them to buy something that they have very little familiarity with. So most of the time, the answer is no. We've gotten away with that because for years we ask our friends, and I get it, our word of mouth is the best, but asking our friends means that our friends probably already know about square dancing because they're our friends and we've talked to them for a while about it. And some friends, even if they don't know a whole lot about it, they'll just come to the first night of class because you're their friend and you ask them to. As time has gone on and our numbers have, have diminished, the average number of years that most of our dancers have been dancing is growing. Many of you, I know, I know you're on mute, but many of you have probably danced 10 years, 15 years. Some of you have been at it 45 years like me. Well, if this is your dominant um, hobby, chances are pretty good that the majority of your friends either already square dance or you've already asked them, they've tried it and decided it wasn't for them. So our ability to ask our friends that word of mouth piece is kind of taken away from us. So what we got to do is promote first. We have to, we have to use things like beginner parties, articles about square dancing, um, that, that word of mouth, just talking to our friends, educating people about who we are, what we are, what we have to offer. It's the same with any business. Who, who's your business? Where are you located? How do I buy from you? And what is it that you, have to, that you have to offer? And in that description of what we have to offer, they have to connect what we're offering with one of two things, a want that they have or a need that they have. Once they make that connection, then they start to move down the marketing funnel into consideration, evaluation, and eventually they might make a purchase or at least like, for example, many clubs will offer the first night of class for free or the, or the first two nights of class for free. So you don't have to make a commitment, just come and try it. So they haven't made a purchase, but now they're in the consideration and evaluation state. So those first couple of nights of class they better have a great time and they better experience what in their mind they thought they were going to experience. Otherwise, when they evaluate, they're going to say, it's not what I thought it was. It's not what I was looking for. I'm not going to take the class. But we have to start at the start of the marketing funnel, which is to drive awareness first more than anything else. And that funnel also represents, even if I put it on a screen in a different way, the awareness part, we have to make a huge number of people aware. And as you go down the funnel, a smaller number will consider it, do evaluation, and an even smaller number will make the purchase. 
And then ultimately, once they make the purchase and they're getting what they like, they fall in love with this hobby. And that's where you get loyalty. That's where they're joining clubs. That's where they're doing things like you folks are doing today, trying to figure out how do we make this hobby that we love bigger and better. And that's where you get into the advocacy part of the funnel. Okay, so the correct way to do it is to flip those two. Get, get the horse in front of the cart. Do the awareness stuff. Um, and unfortunately, we live in the age of instant gratification. We want to do something and instantly get lots of people into our doors. It just doesn't work that way, folks. It just does not. It doesn't for square dancing. It doesn't for any business out there. I can take a business that's uh, a tire shop, a car repair shop, they don't have as much need to get people to understand what it is they do. ABC Tire and Brakes probably sells tires and probably fixes cars. And we all know what that business model looks like. But in the square dancing world, dance, people that don't dance either already have a preconceived notion of square dancing, as in I did that in grade school, or they really don't know much about it at all. And the younger that you get in terms of who you're recruiting, the more likely it is they know absolutely nothing about it. Um, that can be the good, that can be bad. The good is you don't have to overcome some preconceived notion that might be wrong. The flip side is you still have to educate them a lot. So this is marketing 101. Um, we've had plenty of examples where I've had uh, clubs the, and the example I use in the marketing manual is a club decides we're going to do a parade. We're going to put a float in a parade. Well, it takes a lot of work. Got to get a truck, got to get a float, got to get a generator, got to get a caller, got to get dancers, get all that set up. And you do the parade and you go through the parade and you think that your class that starts in a month is going to be just filled with people who want to take the class. When the truth is all you've done is made one impression on the people that saw you go by. So it takes lots and lots of impressions before people start to understand what it is that you do and start to connect what you do with a want or a need that they have. So in pre-COVID times, we offered square dance lessons. Why didn't consumers flock to our lessons when they were offered? I know you all probably have lots of ideas answers in your own head and I have you on mute, but I'm going to give you a few. Lack of awareness. We've all heard, I know you guys have heard, that square dancing has been referred to as the best kept secret. Um, we might have a poor image. I did that in grade school. The image of the poofy skirts and the, and the cloth ties. Some of you probably still wear that. Um, I'm actually finding that young women love the square dance dress. But a lot of them don't. And a lot of them will associate an image with, you know, with not, not what they want to do. So there might be an image problem. And there's also lack of fit. Square dancing is for old folks. Now, I know you're going, well, no, that's not true. Anybody can square dance. But to be honest, I looked at all the faces on the screen before I went to my PowerPoint presentation. And most of you are seniors or getting very close to it. So when I talk about lack of fit, what I'm saying to you is a 45 year old loves their mom and dad, but a 45 year old does not want to give up all of their social time to hang out with mom and dad. So there's a fit problem there as well. I did the uh, beginner party where I invited everybody that I worked with to come and just try square dancing one night. And the lady that I worked with came, she had a blast. A few weeks later, we had our, our first night of class. I worked with her all the time. So she knows a lot about the activity. She didn't come to class and I asked her why. And she said, well, first Mike, her name was Robin. She said, I had a blast. I really enjoyed it, it was cool. And I said, so why didn't you come? She said, because I didn't fit in. I said, what do you mean? She said, it was, the, the place was full of folks that are a lot older than me. And I said, well, Robin, how old are you? She was at the time, 58 years old. 
So here's somebody that knows enough about it, had a blast, but just didn't fit in demographically. That's a challenge that we have and it's getting more challenging, All right? But ultimately the real reason that most people don't take the class is because they haven't associated square dancing as a product that satisfies a need or a want. It's that simple. It's really that simple in all marketing. So, so the solution is to promote the product now and recruit the dancers later. As we're getting ready to come out of COVID, it's true, there's a lot of pent up to demand for social interaction. Really, now's the time that we should be telling people about our activity just as things are being released because a few months ago, and maybe it's a little different in Canada than it is in Nebraska and Iowa, but a few months ago, when we put out here's square dancing, all these people dancing, holding hands with many other people doing hugs, shaking hands, all of those things, no masks, et cetera. I mean, that, that vision is when COVID came out is the perfect Petri dish for spreading the virus. So now as it's starting to get knocked down is going to very soon on, on our threshold is where we need to start talking to people about our activity. Don't get that confused with inviting them to take a class immediately. They have to understand what it is that it's a safe environment, but connecting it with things that with needs or wants that they have. Okay, I want to talk about business space. This is true about just about any business. Most businesses, if you looked at their customer profile, they have a customer profile that's basically a, um, a, a, a triangle. The bottom of the triangle is the largest number of people that buy from them, a large base of customers that are fairly infrequent, but there's a bunch of them. And then you have frequent customers. That's kind of the middle of the funnel. And you have the super users. So I'll give you a couple of examples of how that works. Uh, I imagine you all have olive gardens up there in Canada. We have them all over here. I fit into the large base of infrequent customers. I go to, I go to Olive Garden couple times a year. I like their food. I like a lot of other restaurants as well. So maybe twice a year. The once a month customer is my daughter and her husband. They love Olive Garden. Right now they're in Germany, so they don't have them. Uh, but when they were here in the States, um, they, they went probably once a month. And Olive Garden counts, counts on a big chunk of their businesses, a big chunk of their customers coming pretty much once a month. And then you got other folks that frankly go there once a week. They're what we call super users. And they need a combination of all of those people to make their business work. Here's another example. And this is a little bit more related to us. Recreational soccer. So we're gonna talk about soccer. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, soccer was not a big sport in the United States. There was a little bit of it going on, but we didn't have organized soccer in rec leagues and competitive leagues. We didn't have soccer clubs and high school competing, uh, all of that kind of stuff. So what happened is um, the, the soccer was big in Europe and the, the leaders from there worked here in the States to start to create recreational soccer leagues, which developed into competitive soccer leagues, which developed into professional leagues. So now we have uh, the United States Soccer Association that has professional soccer leagues uh, that compete against the European soccer groups. But that, local, that national professional group doesn't work without starting out by getting a massive amount of people to try and fall in love with soccer. That's how that business model works. So now let me show you what the square dance business model work looks like. So back to the president thing. This is your business model, okay? You've got infrequent users, uh, a customer, uh, the community dance, beginner events, basics, and some mainstream. I'm sure many of you have members of your club that come to your club dances two or three times a year, and that's as much as they participate. Um, then the next level, is a little bit more frequent users. So this is, at least in my area, 
a lot of mainstream dancers, some plus dancers, many of the members in, in local clubs only dance at their local club. That's all. That's as much as they engage in the hobby. And that's okay. We need them. And then you got pretty frequent users. And I'd say that for the most part, um, I fell into this category. Um, dance mainstream, dance some plus. We go dancing. We dance at our home clubs. We dance and visit other clubs. We chase banners. I don't know if you guys do banners. I imagine you do. Uh, we do all that kind of stuff. And then you had the super users. Uh, right now, that's probably advanced and challenged dancers. Uh, very likely a number of plus dancers as well. These are the folks that if they could, they'd dance five nights a week. Uh, they probably can't because we don't have as many clubs as we used to have. But when I started, I danced five or six nights a week. And those, that's what our business model looks like. The problem is we're, we're about to tip over. We don't have a big base of this lower funnel, this lower part. So, all right. So in pre-COVID times, when we held square dance lessons, here's what would happen. Typically, half of our lessons didn't finish the class. And then the half that did, didn't stay active for more than a couple of years. Why? And the answer is simple. We have a product problem. So this is one of the four Ps, product, price, place, and promotion. So this is about, um, this, is, this is not about recruiting. This is about retention. I've heard many people say, if we could have just kept everybody that we've taught in the last 10 years, we'd have huge floors of dancers. Now, I don't care how good your product is. You're not going to keep everybody. But we're losing, we're losing three quarters of them at a minimum within the first couple of years. And the reason is they didn't get what they came for. You know, what they came for and what they got were different. So let's talk about what they came for. Uh, and I've talked to a lot of a lot of beginners, um, and I'd love to for us to finance research to even back more of this up. I've had access to some that's related, but I completely believe this. I think that dancers that begin class, they want to take a few lessons because they want to be able to dance. Um, they want to be entertained. That makes sense. They want to be welcomed and they want to have fun. I think it really boils down pretty much to those four. I know that we offer great, great um, health benefits. You could lose weight if you didn't go out to eat after the dances. You could do all those kinds of things. But very few dancers came to class because they wanted to get exercise. They mostly are there for the social environment. They want to be entertained. They want to dance. They want to have fun. And they're not getting it. So I'm gonna give you a scenario to, to back that up. Here's a mainstream class. Beginners, and this is pre-COVID. This is actually about 10 years ago. Around here, dancers were asked to, beginners were asked to sign up for 20 weeks of lessons that were offered only once a year on Thursday nights from seven to 9 a.m. or seven to 9 p.m. We asked them to pay for it all up front and then successfully complete those lessons. Once they did that, learning 67 calls from a multitude of positions and applications before they're ever allowed to attend a local club dance. And they're usually encouraged to take the next set of lessons plus before they finish the first. So then once they finished, they were asked to go dance in an unfamiliar location to a different caller who calls faster than they're used to using more complicated choreography than they're used to with mostly strangers who weren't all that tolerant of their slowness and lack of efficiency at executing the calls where they can only dance 10 of the 26 pieces of music that were played. 10 mainstream tips, so five tips. Four, there were four plus records, so two tips. And there were 12 rounds, but they were asked to pay the same as everybody else. We don't recognize that because we're not them. But think about that. Is that realistic? Is that really what they were looking for? The same thing holds true with PLUS. And I'll use this example. Um, there are several cl clubs in California that do this. Beginners are asked to sign up for a year of lessons 
that's offered only once a year on Thursdays from seven to nine or whatever night it is, pay for it, complete the lessons learning now 95 calls from a multitude of positions and applications before being allowed to attend a club. So you think about that. Today, we want to teach lessoners so that they understand the call swing through. And the call swing through by definition is those who can turn half by the right, then those who can turn half by the left. And so our expectation has gone from a basic four person ocean wave, probably the guys on the end and the girls in the middle to we need to be able to do it from a, a four person ocean wave, from a three person ocean wave, from a mini wave of two people, from a tidal wave where all eight are in it, we need to be able to understand that if we're in a left-handed ocean wave instead of a right-handed ocean wave, that a swing through starts with the centers trading by the right and then everybody trading by the left. And oh, by the way, there's no such thing as a guy's spot or a girl's spot. You need to be able to do it from every location in any one of those ocean waves. We would even ask them from a tidal wave to understand that that swing through is different from an from an all eight or from a grand swing through where each ocean wave of four on each end of the tidal wave is its own subset. And that's the only people you work with. And if it's a left hand, you get where I'm going. This is the kind of stuff we're asking people who just wanted to come and dance to understand before they graduate from class. That's a real challenge. So I'm gonna give you some background on how this came about. Um, and we're all at fault here, and none of us are wholly at fault. But here's the history. And I started dancing, so you know, in 1976. Um, clubs were 12 to 25 squares. Festivals were 100 squares. National conventions had 20 to 35,000 people. We taught beginners in 50, the, the 50 basics. In 1976, about half of the clubs in the Omaha area were still teaching the 50 basics. And we taught them in 12 weeks. So that was a little over four calls a night on average. The reason that we taught it in 12 weeks is because we're a big farming community. Now, Omaha isn't. We actually don't herd the cattle down Main Street in Omaha anymore. But it was basically built so that a person could come and learn sometime between the fall harvest and the spring planting season. So that's how we ended up with 12 weeks. And we taught them the 50 basics. Then today, our clubs are three to maybe 12 squares, a festival, eight squares in many areas is a festival, 25 would be huge. Now we're at 4,000 or less at nationals, and beginners are taught either 67 or 95 calls, whether it's mainstream or plus, in 20 to 50 weeks. So three, three to, as, to less than two calls a night. We increase uh, the, uh, there's an increase in the complicated choreography that's happened over time, which is requiring longer teach time. And then longer teach time means, frankly, a lot longer before that person who just came and wanted to learn enough to dance. Now we're asking them for, to be in class for a very long period of time before they can dance. It's a real challenge. So the result is we got high dropout rate and low retention rate, which means, Mr. or Mrs. President, your new customer came, tried it, left, and now you need to find more new customers who will come try it and leave. So this is the retention part. If we can get them there, we have got to do a better job of retaining them. And I know this is not promotion, this is the product part of marketing in general. So I'm gonna kind of try to fly through this. This is kind of what happened. So to start with, we have a basic program and we have a mainstream program. And the difference between those two programs right now is 19 calls. So it's a, when you think about what it takes to go from basics to mainstream, it's a small step. So we just decided to teach mainstream. Okay, that's fine. But lessons went from 12 to 20 nights. And, ten, and tenured dancers, 
liked it because they're in it and they're the ones that are making the decisions and this is their hobby and they want more. So then dancers were, and then that's why I'm saying the dancers were making the decisions about what they wanted as opposed to that new dancer coming in and what that new dancer wanted. As this is going along, our tenured dancers got older. Now beginners found it harder to learn and a longer time before they got what they came for. As callers, we introduced more calls. We did that to entertain the tenured dancers because they wanted more calls and they loved it. Tenured dancers who oversee the running of the clubs and hiring callers that the folks who were you know sort of the deep dive into the activity were the ones that were making the decisions and it was real easy to lose track of what is that beginner looking for because if they don't get what they're looking for in a fairly short length of time they're gonna leave it just makes sense we all try hobbies it's like me reading a book i don't read a lot but if you get me within the first two chapters of a book, I'm hooked and I'm into that book until it's done. If you don't get me in the first two chapters of that book, I'm putting the book on a shelf and I'm not going back. So that's relate that to that new dancer who walks in and hasn't had the opportunity to dance. They have only had the opportunity to be taught. So now callers started to introduce more complicated choreography to entertain the tenured, the tenured dancers. And you loved it, great. But now there's more complications. So now the journey from a beginner became 20 weeks of class with a higher expectation of call knowledge and execution. And our tenured dancers, acceptance of beginners who wouldn't keep them waned. I know no one would ever want to admit this. And I'm sure that most of you have seen it on the dance floor that a new dancer finally finishes class, they come to class or they come to dance, they can't keep up, they can't execute the calls, the, the squares break down. And in, instead of people adjusting to take care of them, I've seen it and I've not just seen it in Omaha, I've seen it in many places where I've traveled to, that the tenured dancer wants complicated choreography and more of it and their ability to understand that new dancer can't handle it wanes. That's the welcome part. Uh, so now the journey for a beginner became 25 weeks of class. That way they could learn enough and keep up. And beginners found it harder to learn and even longer before they could dance. Now there's more, all right? Tenured dancers still wanted more and they oversaw running the clubs and hiring the callers and making the decisions based on what they wanted, losing track of what that beginner dancer wanted. So as they got older and with the lack of beginners, the average age of square dancers got older. So the answer, <laughs> because the tenured dancers wanted more, was to add 28 more calls and start dancing plus. Wow, now callers, and I'm, I, don't, I know you can see me, I'm raising my hand. I am absolutely raising my hand telling you I am guilty of this, guilty as charged. We saw a new revenue stream to teach mainstream dancers to dance plus and to start our own plus clubs. And that's great, except as that has happened, many areas around the country, and I can't speak for, for, uh, uh, for uh, Canada, but in many areas of the United States, eliminate the mainstream clubs were just eliminated and they were replaced with plus clubs. So now a beginner has to come and take class for a whole year with a higher expectation of call knowledge and executions. Found it harder to learn way too long before they got what they came for. So now most of our customer base is older, longtime dancers who dance plus or higher, who still make the decisions based on what they want including running our clubs and hiring our callers, who, by the way, those callers better call what they want or they're not gonna get hired. Somewhere in the progression of time, we have completely lost track of what someone who's never square danced before wants when they first come to take lessons. So you've let your high frequency customers make all the decisions about running your company based solely on what they want. 
and frankly, um, whoop, I'm sorry, let me go back. I lost track. Anyway, I think you got my point. So I also want to talk about the money side of this. And this is a tough piece, you know, to, to talk about because remember that everybody that's running our club essentially are our customers, our current customers. And they're making all the decisions about our, about, our, now I did it. Hang on, previous, here we go. And they're making all the decisions about how to run our business. So human nature is to pay less, not more. I get it. I told you about the, the, the Buick I drive. It's a $40,000 car. If I, as the customer, got to make all the decisions and the Buick dealership that I bought it from had to abide by those decisions, I would have told them, nope, I'm only paying $10,000 for my car because I run the business and I said so. So now we don't have a marketing fund because our customers, the ones who run our business, didn't plan for one. We don't have a marketing fund because our customers who run our business don't want to pay for one. And our customers who run our business and make the decisions no longer care where we dance because it's not about the venue anymore. It's not about the experience. It's about the choreography and it's about the challenge. And because of that, we really don't care where we dance. So uh, we, dan we prefer to dance in a church basement versus paying more for a more attractive venue. However, our new dancer probably is okay with dancing in a church basement, would rather dance in a ballroom because that's what their expectation is. But we're not willing to pay for it. So that's a problem. So now our customers who are run the business are older. And since we'd rather pay less than decide to take advantage of, of we decided to take advantage of our age, and many clubs around the country now are dancing in a senior center. They're dancing in the senior center because they're seniors and they can get the hall for cheap, sometimes for free. And so if they can get the hall for cheap or for free, great. We don't have to increase our dues. We don't have to charge more at the door. I get it because I don't want to pay any more than anybody else, but it's not good for our business. Callers are expensive. I know it sounds like callers are expensive. Most of you, unless you're a caller, you don't really know about the expenses that we have related to this. So to give you an example, in 2019, I, I personally, Mike Hogan, called about 100 events and had a net loss of $2,500. So every time you paid $6 to dance to me, I paid $25 to call for you. So there's a problem there. So if we have to attract and we must attract new dancers and we got to retain new dancers, even if those new dancers mean 55 instead of 65, if our average age is 75, that 65 year old will dance with us. A 55 year old is not going to feel like they fit in. That's the example that I gave you of Robin. Now, yes, there's one offs. Some of us have teenagers and young adults that are dancing in our clubs. Those are one-offs, but generally speaking, and there's a whole section about marketing to different age generations in the marketing manual. Generally speaking, we have a comfort zone of who we're comfortable dancing with. So uh, if we want to attract 55-year-olds, number one, you cannot dance in a senior center. You just can't. I'm telling you, a 60-year-old, when you say we dance at the senior center, they're still, they're kind of nervous about officially being referred to as a senior and dancing in a senior center is not where they want to be. These same people, they'll sign up for eight ballroom dancing lessons and they'll pay $600 for eight ballroom dancing lessons. It's true. Check it out. So paying in their case, paying 10 to even $20 a night per person for lessons. That doesn't phase them a bit. Um, the bottom line is, once we get them there, we got to give them what they came for. So that's the money side. Okay, so let me talk about what we need to change about our product if we want to make it acceptable and more desirable. These are my beliefs. They're not the stuff that I just pulled out of my hat. 
Uh, I've done a lot of research. Uh, I have read a lot of material. I also have 45 years of calling experience. And remember that I started at 13. I'm currently 58. That would be where the 45 years in calling comes from. So I've seen it from lots of different generations as I've, as I've grown older. So here's what I believe. I believe lessons should take no more than 10 weeks. I think that lessons need to be offered, offered several times each year. I think at five weeks, we should start holding dances that these people can go and dance instead of class. I'm not saying don't hold class. I'm saying set up another night where it's just dance. Come and we'll call what you've learned so far so that you can experience the dance, not just lessons. Um, I think there should be clubs that dance regularly at that 10 week program. A lot of people will come and try it and they don't wanna move on or they're nervous about moving on. In Omaha, we've taught multi-cycle and we, do, we did multi-cycle, we still do, in two 10-week sessions. And I can tell you, there's a bunch of people that finish the first 10 weeks and go, nope, I'm just going to take the, the first 10 weeks again. I'm not ready for the next 10 weeks. So we need to have a place where those people can get a lot of wind in their face, a lot of dance time. So there should be clubs that regularly dance at that 10-week level. Um, I believe that we should include other forms of dancing, mixers, lines, uh, easy rounds, something to give them more than just square dancing. Um, one, of the, one of the pieces that you'd find in the, in the marketing manual is uh, a piece that came from the Harvard Business School. And it talks about relative things for marketing your business. And it, and it talks about specifically merchandising. And in merchandising, in our case, is what does our venue look like? I know we don't, we just want to dance. We don't want it all to work. They're looking for a party. We should decorate for every dance. I believe in stage, maybe because I'm five, six on a tall day. And I believe in showmanship. Uh, I don't think it's the caller's job to stand up there and just call. It's the, it's the caller's job or the cure's job to entertain those dancers. So I believe in a stage and I believe in showmanship. I believe folks would rather dance in a ballroom than a basement. I believe we should charge more for our dances. Jeans are appropriate for some dances. Petticoats and cloth ties are a turnoff to potential dancers. I've heard that, I've heard that in the research. Callers should dress appropriately for the occasion. Not meaning there isn't a time, time when callers can wear shorts and, and uh, um, a polo shirt. I don't believe a caller should ever be on stage with a t-shirt, but that's me. Um, so they should dress appropriately for the occasions. I believe there's times when all generations can call, can dance together, yet it's okay if my generation doesn't want to dance with my dads and my sons doesn't want to dance with me. I also think it's totally fine that we use lots of different kinds of music, and we do. For example, my son doesn't want to dance to Barry Manilow, and it's okay that I don't want to dance to The weekend. I'll bet most of you don't have a clue who The weekend is, but The weekend is actually the gentleman that was the entertainer at halftime at this year's Super Bowl. So before I read the last statement, I want to give you an example of the venue piece. I work in Sioux City, Iowa. When I started calling, there were probably 10 to 12 clubs here in the Sioux City area. And the dancers ran the club, so the customer ran the club, made the decisions. They stumbled into an opportunity to move all of their dances, both squares and rounds, to one location within the, within the city because they could get it for free. The company that owned the building, building said, you know what, we'll give you our space for free. We won't charge you a dime. You're responsible, you can decorate it. You're responsible to clean up, lock up, et cetera. And so they did that. They all moved. They adjusted their dance nights and they moved to the same venue. Now, I'll tell you, the venue was in the basement of this office building. And so it was a basement with a hung ceiling. It was a little bit of a low ceiling, cement floor, uh, cinder block walls. Not, not really what a new dancer would think that's where I want to go. But they did their best to decorate it, take, you know, take good care of it. Today, there are no clubs 
in Sioux City, Iowa. None. No square dance clubs, no round dance clubs. And I believe the, a big part of that, not all of it, but a big part had to do with where they danced. So now I've described this location. Specifically, it was the basement of the waste management building. So from a marketing standpoint, they told people who might have had an interest that they dance in the basement of the garbage company's building. Horrible blunder from a marketing standpoint. Never gave it a thought. They never gave it a thought because they don't run it like a business. You got to run it like a business. Okay. So here's some things I, I told you stuff I do believe in. Here's a few things I don't believe in. I don't believe we should encourage new dancers to move to the next program. Um, it just aches me when I'm five nights from finishing my mainstream lessons and I've already got members of the plus club that might happen to belong to our mainstream club as well that are already telling them all about plus and there's going to be a class starting or it's the same thing if it's round dancing. You've got to let people move on their own. I'm not saying they won't, but they've got to have time to experience the dance that they've come to learn if they if they just move into plus right away or right into round dance lessons they're in perpetually in learning mode and never in the dance social enjoyment mode it's no wonder that we lose a lot of them in that process i don't believe we should ask new dancers to be officers in our club for at least three years and i know we're having trouble getting people to run for office don't ask them to be in charge that's not what they came for once they're there and they fall in love with their activity and they recognize that someone needs to be a leader to help run things, that's when it's time to ask them. And if they say no, that's okay. Um, and I've made it obvious, I don't think we should be dancing in senior centers. I know it's okay, it fits, it's free. If we ever want to grow the square dance audience below retirement age, we are not gonna be doing it by dancing in senior centers. It just doesn't happen. Okay. Now, I know you guys have all heard about the Social Square Dancing Initiative. And I know you're sitting here going, oh, he's been preaching social square dancing. It's not. What I've been talking about is not me preaching about social square dancing. Um, virtually every single opinion and recommend, recommendation that I put in here, I made in a speech in 2008 at Prairie Conclave. Prairie Conclave was a leadership weekend that we held in Nebraska. So that's what, 13 years ago, long before the concept of SSD ever came around. So what you do need to know is SSD is an initiative that is built essentially to be the very product that I talked about 13 years ago. Um, so this is I guess my first real ringing endorsement of it. I know there's other programs. We have the basic program. We have uh, another, a couple of other programs and we have SSD. SSD is the best thought out with all the background information for callers on how to teach it and clubs on how to run it uh, that I've seen. Um, and that's really because of Jerry's story and all the work that he did. Here's what it is essentially uh, just in a few bullet points. It's 50 calls. It's 12 weeks of class. It's several new classes a year. The emphasis is on standard applications for callers. You know what that is. For dancers, it means you don't have to understand a left-handed tidal wave and how a swing through is done from it. So no left swing throughs from right-handed tidal waves. Um, dancers who are expect, so it's where dancers are expected or excited about dancing. They can invite their friends uh, who will be dancing in a very short time. It's where dancers are dancing, enjoying each other's company, having fun with no responsibilities. It's where they can take a break from dancing if they want to and return and not feel intimidated or scared. Uh, it's where dancers can enjoy dancing without dedicating a large portion of time to being a student and where they're not pressured to climb the staircase of calls. Hang on, my phone is rolled over. I'm just going to hang up on them. How's that? So 
All right. So virtually, like I said, all that. So here's here's the deal. What did these people come when, what was the product they were expecting when they come to take lessons? Take a few lessons, be entertained, be welcomed, have fun. I'm telling you, what I'm seeing, everything I'm seeing on SSD is built to deliver exactly what they expected. Let them dance. All right, back to kind of the start and then we'll get into a little bit more marketing promotion side of it. Um, so a well, a well stated problem is half solved. So now we've talked about some additional problems. And the biggest one is the product that we're putting out for beginners and it's really causing retention issues. Who's in charge? Square Dance leadership organizations are in charge. And that means it's you. Yes, I, I found your logo on your website, stole it and added it to my, to my PowerPoint. And it's me. And when I say me, it's not just me. Uh, Caller Lab, and, and, and as I said, I'm vice chairman right now. Caller Lab has finally listened and come around to not spending it, it, amazing amount of times working on definitions and applications to really starting to take a look at the product. Okay, so now let's talk about COVID-19 and its effect on marketing. So it essentially, marketing hasn't changed. Marketing principles are exactly the same as they were pre-COVID, except the time in which we execute our marketing initiatives. So here's some disadvantages. Uh, right now, availability of venues to hold classes are limited and possibly closed. It's impossible to social distance when we're square dancing. Current dancers fall into, and this is many of you, hopefully many of you have already got vaccinated. But especially when COVID first hit, a large number of our dancers were high risk category due to age and underlying health issues. And prospects had safety concerns. How do you put a how do you put a, a picture of people square dancing and say this is a safe environment when COVID first came out? Those were pro those were problems. Now we've got some advantages. As we said at the start, prospects are anxious for life to get back to normal. There is a high pent up demand for people uh, to for normal desire and a need for social interaction. These people are. I can tell you from. The travel and tourism industry, we study that a lot in my business. If you're running a travel and tourism type of business, get ready for the boom. It's going to be like the roaring 20s. People are seeking out and then people are seeking also, frankly, seeking out means of exercising. So there's some big advantages coming out of it that we can take advantage of. Timing and the content of your message um, is important. So we talked about the marketing funnel and that it starts with awareness. So the marketing of why Square Dance, we can start that now. Tell your story, address safety issues if it's needed, speak to the products or to the prospects needs because right now they need to get out of the house. They need to interact with people. They need to move. They need to have fun. That's pent up right now. So speaking to that, those needs will cut through more than it ever has. And this type of brand marketing can and should take place all the time, not just right now. But um, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, I'm, I haven't, I've actually never been in Canada. But I'm guessing you have this little burger restaurant called McDonald's up there. And hardly anybody would tell you that McDonald's makes the great, the best hamburger. But McDonald's sells more hamburgers than anybody in the world by leaps and bounds. Literally, you would think McDonald's doesn't need to advertise. Everybody knows McDonald's. McDonald's spends $7 million a day marketing McDonald's. You always have to be telling people about your product. And then the, the recruitment side of it, of when, instead of why, but the when, okay, here's, here's my recommendation. Set up your cl class to start once your state and local CDC guidelines allow group gatherings. I recommend setting up your class to start not immediately, but about three months after group gatherings are allowed 
with minimal, restri with minimal restrictions. The reason that I say three months is because you need that time when, window to tell people our story about why so that they start to have a desire for the activity. If you've got a good, uh, if you've got good website presence, that's where they start doing the research. They start looking into the activity. And then when it's time to actually hold class, they'll come and sample it. And if they're getting what they came for, they'll take. So I'm saying about three months after. I realize uh, my, my mother lives in uh, Minnesota and she tells me she is not going to get the, uh, the vaccination. And for her own personal reasons, and I'm not going to go into them, but there are people who won't get the vaccination. And there, and there are people who are still skeptical. It's going to take time once things start opening up before people actually start going, okay, life is back to normal. So that's why I say three months. Uh, the biggest change that that would happen in the message content is just the addition of where and when you still tell them why you just now need to tell them and this is when it's time to recruit tell them where and when and then you start inviting prospects to your class as soon as the date and location are set all right let's go back to this marketing funnel so there are a lot of marketing tactics this is the promotion side and I'm, I'm going to, I'm, again, I'm going to pitch the uh, Square Dance Marketing Manual. The marketing manual as it sits right now is 91 pages of which I wrote about 90% of everything that's in that. I just happen to be in the position where what I do for a living and what I do because I love it, there's a nice intersection. So I wrote a lot of it. Um, so there's way too many things that you could do. So keep in mind that the most important part of the marketing funnel is awareness, the top of the funnel. So I'm going to show you tactics below. All of them are explained in the Caller Lab Square Dance Marketing Manual. At a minimum, I recommend the following. Elevator pitch, database, public exhibitions, public events, direct contact sales, utilize public activity listings, utilize public service announcements, Local website development, because those folks are going to go look on a website before they look anywhere else to find out more information. Email signatures. All of us have email. All of us have an email signature. If you just put something about square dancing in your signature, every time you communicate with somebody, it starts to grow the awareness that square dancing exists. Facebook, and this is on a local level, not, not, paid, not paid social media. Uh, which I could tell you about that for hours, but I'm not going to. Uh, business cards and event signage. Every one of those tactics is in the, the marketing manual, and it tells you CSDMM is, MM is this Color Lab Square Dance Marketing Manual. Gives you the section and the page number. Do me a favor if you get the manual. Do not go to those immediately. Please, I spent a lot of time putting marketing principles, how to go about it in the first half. So many people get that and they go, I'm going to do Facebook. I'll just go to the Facebook session section and read it. And they get completely lost on the overall of how you go about marketing. So if you do get the marketing manual, please read the first several sections. Okay. So the idea is we're going to take our consumer, this person who doesn't dance from knowing nothing about square dancing to loving it. Here are the pieces that affect uh, the different stages in the marketing funnel. Elevator pitches, public exhibitions, activity listings, service announcements, email signatures, Facebook, business card, event signage, all that drives awareness. The cool part about all of those things is most of them have no cost. And even things like business cards and event signage have very little cost associated with it. Because guess what? We don't have a marketing budget. Why don't we have a marketing budget? Because we didn't plan for one and we didn't want to pay for one. You got to have a marketing budget. It's got to be part of your overall planning. We just didn't do it. And we've got to move into that realm. To get people into the consideration stage, you still have things like the elevator pitch, but now you can be doing dance parties, not beginner class. It's a dance party. I don't care if you host 10 couples or 20 singles or some combination that are your friends 
and you have the caller over and you just do a fun night in your garage. Maybe you do a little barbecue with it. You teach them some square dancing for about an hour. They sit around afterwards and maybe even drink a beer together uh, before you square dance, not after. Up to you. But that gives somebody an, uh, an actual opportunity to sample. Most of us wouldn't buy a car without test driving it first. Why do we think them having very little knowledge about the activity that they're just going to purchase, put their money down on the table to take lessons? They need to experience. So special events like dance parties are important. Direct contact sales, that's you going out and talking to, to friends, coworkers, family members, church members, wherever. Uh, you can still use it, public activities, serve it, all that stuff. Okay. The evaluation stage. So this is really important. This is where they're now really looking into it. I'm, you've tweaked my interest. I want to learn a little bit more to decide if it's something that I want to do. This is where your dance parties come in. Um, public activities, PSAs, and all that kind of stuff help. But giving people that opportunity to experience. Exhibitions fit into this. They get to see it. Those things are important. They take work and they take time. And you got to work. If you're a caller and you're listening to this, those events are things that we have to do if we want to help our activity grow. So if you're a caller and you're used to getting paid $200 for an event, don't look to get paid 200 bucks for an exhibition because nobody's paying for the exhibition. There's no revenue to it. It's a marketing thing. So just understand that we have to do that. And everybody today visits websites. So you got to have, you got to have a web presence. You probably do. I know your organization does because I stole your logo off your website, but your website is more about the current customers, the people who already dance than it is about people who might be interested in dancing. At a minimum, at least they have an ability to get in contact with you if they're interested in it. Okay. The purchase part is buying. Come to, come to class, buy. You would promote, promote that like you would a special event. Same as um, the special event piece that's right above it. And then loyalty. So there's loyalty. There's no marketing tactic to it from an external marketing side. It's a retention issue and it's handled differently. But retention and loyalty really is built about one, falling in love with the dance and two, falling in love with the people that they dance with. So other social activities, maybe your club has a picnic night and you don't dance. Maybe you have a card night or maybe you have other kinds of things that cause them to connect socially so that they're really tied in with their friends. That causes loyalty. And eventually that turns into advocacy. We fell in love with it and we tell people all about how much we love it, the activity. Okay, just a real highlight on the Square Dance Marketing Manual. It has education about marketing fundamentals, research about the state of our activity and an understanding of the general public's image and awareness of our activity. Uh, it has defined marketing strategies so I didn't go through this, but target demographics. Who are we going to target? I know we want anybody above the age of six to square dance, six to 99. Marketing doesn't work that way. Overall branding helps to work that way. But when you start looking at who you really want to recruit, you need to select a specific target demographic to go after. Otherwise, you're doing spray and pray, and I guarantee you, you don't have enough money to do that and be successful, okay? So target demographics, that, once you know that group, think about what the benefits that they're looking for, not, for example, what a 55-year-old is looking for may be very different than what a 25-year-old is looking for. So if, you're, if that 55-year-old is your target demographic, you need to be talking about the benefits that are sought by that 55-year-old because we only buy something because we need it or we want it. And if you can't explain square dancing so that it satisfies the 55-year-old's need or want, they're not going to take lessons from you. 
Um, Got to analyze our product versus the products we compete with. Define your marketing challenges and create a, pos a position statement. All of that is covered in the marketing manual. Whoops. Uh, brand management tactics is in there. There's a large list of tactic of marketing tactics and how to. So if you wanted to do, like for example, I use the uh, the email signature. It's very simple, but some people one would never have thought of it, and two aren't really sure how to go about it. So it's, it explains that there there are pages and pages. There's also recommendations like the ones I just came through. There's a whole list of fundraising ideas. Um, and there are three case studies of clubs that went from almost extinct to very large. And I've shared all three of those, stu those case studies so that you can see what they did. And maybe that's something that you can repeat. Um, I also want you to know about resources. Of course, you have the Caller Lab Foundation. If you don't know about the Caller Lab Foundation, it's an independent 501c3, independent of Caller Lab itself. And it's set up to do lesson grants, caller education grants, and square dance marketing grants. All you got to do is go to callerlab.org. You'll be able to find the foundation and all of the things that we that the foundation do, d does. Sorry, grammar. <clears throat> all right. There's the Caller Lab Marketing Committee, which up until, frankly, a few months ago, I was the chairperson of that committee. Um, so that committee has a lot of people, not a lot. It has more people on average that know more about marketing. So if you're looking for individual advice and recommendations, just ask. You can get a hold of the Caller Lab Home Office. They'll get you in touch with myself. Um, Jack Platties is the new chairman. Justin Russell is the vice chairman. There are several other members of that committee that have a lot of knowledge about marketing. So just ask. Um, if you're looking for face-to-face -face training, like this, just ask. Um, there is marketing material related, uh, marketing material related uh, education pieces uh, from past Caller Lab conventions, both on audio and on video. You can get those. Um, Barry Clasper de developed the Caller Lab Knowledge Base website. There are tons of articles in there, winning, winning ways success stories in there. It's a fabulous site. It's easy to find what you're looking for. All right. So then you have the arts, which is the Alliance for Round Traditional and Square Dancing. They have marketing collateral material. They're the ones that created the national logo and the slogan, although actually the slogan Live Lively Square Dance came from me. Um, and there's a whole explanation of why we use that slogan. Um, there's an Adabuck program. It's a fundraising program. I actually was uh, myself and Tom Rodebach were chair and vice chair when, when we wrote that and then gave it to the arts. There's an education grant program and there's a recruitment plan that I actually wrote in 2005 uh, that's on there. And of course, the Square Dance Marketing Manual is on there as well. And the USDA has lots of stuff. So there are a lot of resources out there that you can turn to. And finally, there's me. <laughs> uh, my email is Mike dot hogan at cox.net and the phone number on there is my cell phone um yes i'm a busy guy uh yes i love this activity so much that i give so much time to it you know i've been president of this and chairman of that for decades it's just what we do and we love the activity so if you get stuck you don't know who to turn to you can always reach out to me okay um so problem well stated is half solved Who's in charge? We are the leaders of the activity. What can we do? First, embrace change and modify your product so our beginners stay. You can develop a plan to market square dancing to the public where you live. The Square Dance Marketing Manual will help you with that. You got to raise funds, and funds can be raised all kinds of ways. Uh, I'm not, I don't know a lot of you that are on today's presentation. But I know amongst you, there's somebody there that absolutely loves this activity that is a gazillionaire. <laughs> and so, you know, gazillionaires who love things can make massive contributions. But if you're concerned about, well, can I, do I do that? If I did that, where would I do that? 
certainly you can give to this organization. You could give to the Collar Lab Square to the uh, Collar Lab Foundation, which is a 501c3. Uh, there's a lot of places that you can do that. Um, we need to aggressively pursue opportunities to get out in front of the public. We need to dance in front of the public and we need to give the public opportunities to try dancing without making a big commitment. So that's uh, non-dancers to sample through beginner dances and parties, okay? We, we're, uh, we need to make learning to dance easy and readily available. That's why multiple classes a year is much better. If you have, even if all of your clubs in your area only offered one class a year, you sh if, if that were the case, you shouldn't all start in September. We should have multiple entry points for people to be begin square dancing. I used ABC Tire and Brake earlier as an example. There's only about 2% of the market that's ever in the, in the buying stage of buying a car, or I mean, buying a tire or tires. But we, the problem is we don't know when they will be. So ABC Tire and Brakes markets year round and you can buy tires from them anytime, not just in September. Okay, so uh, one of my favorite Albert Einstein quotes, vision without action is hallucination. And that's it. I really appreciate everybody being on the call today. We're gonna open up the mics in a moment, uh, take some questions and answers. I guarantee you, I don't have all the answers, but I'll at least the college try. And thank you all so much for taking the time and the interest to find out how we can help our square dance activity. Thank you, Mike. Um, I didn't get a single question during chat, so obviously they were uh, very riveted on your presentation. So I'm going to open it up so that uh, if anybody wants to ask you a question, they may unmute themselves now. Hour and 20 minutes. Sorry, guys. No, yeah, obviously they were they were paying attention. So um, anybody got questions? No. Wow. Do. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Brian, of course. <laughs> yeah, Brian says, or somebody says, email in the chat form. Email. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's nice to have the mic open again. I was going to ask initially, Mike, uh, the graphics that you presented today, do they differ from what you had uh, displayed for the USDA session back in February? Nope. No. You know, uh, Brian, the reason it looks different is I had a few pages that I had a lot of tiny little print in and I made them into two pages so I could blow it up. Well, Otherwise, it was right. identical. Thank All you I did was change the format, change, change the color scheme and change the logos. That was it. Wow. Thank you for adding the BC Federation's logo. We're well, sure. Privileged. I do proposals all the time. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly did make some notes and I'm wondering, Mike, regarding uh, targeting various demographics, uh, what considerations should be made uh, relative to lesson day, place, time uh, for the different age groups? It seems to me like for working people, um, children, uh, they're dealing with um, workday schedules and children having to go to school. When should we offer sessions for them? Okay. So yeah, you got to look at you got to look at the uh, the age group, and you have to look at their lifestyle. And like I said earlier, there's always one-offs. But think about it this way: if 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 we use the example of uh, junior high aged students, I'm, I'm not suggesting that that's the best place for us to go. But if if you had that, if you had a junior high aged students, well, one. Mom and dad don't want them in lessons until 10 o'clock at night on a weeknight, right? They don't want that. Two, they're in school during the day. So for that group, and three, they don't, they might be taking lessons because mom and dad made them instead of they wanted to. So they're not going to want to spend their Friday night and Saturday night there. And they're probably not going, you know, probably Sunday morning is not good because of church. So you're really limited to Saturdays during the day, Sunday sometime between noon and supper, and supper time for that group. Now for seniors, uh, depending on, on their age, 
if they're all retired, and I'm not saying that's the best place for us to go either, but if they're all retired, why wouldn't we offer it during the middle of the day? Look, my mother-in-law, because I'm not going to talk about any of you because I don't know you all that well, but my mother-in-law is 78 years old. And no, you know what? She's a bad example. Never mind. <laughs> my, my mother is. <laughs> and she lives with me, by the way. <laughs> it's, wor it's working out. But um, okay, I know a lot of dancers that go uh, to Arizona or Texas for the winter. And they eat supper at four o'clock. And the dance is over at 8.30 or 9, because 9 o'clock, they're in bed. So if you had that group, you probably don't want to offer lessons that goes until 10 o'clock at night. So really, you got to look at the lifestyle of the people that you're recruiting and figure out the best spot. And frankly, it's different for some of them. So I don't know if your club would have the wherewithal, but if you had the wherewithal to offer a couple of different times, great. I would love the scenario. Well, obviously we have to have enough people take the class because we got to pay the rent. But I would love it if a club offered Tuesday night classes and Saturday morning classes or Wednesday night classes and Saturday morning classes. And when someone came and took the class, they signed up to take class. The, the curriculum is essentially the same both times. So you come Wednesday night and then if you can make it, you can come Saturday and get it again. Repetition, frequency. We use that in marketing all the time. Frequency to the target. We need dance time. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever went to a movie, watched the movie, and then you saw it again a second time and there are a bunch of pieces in the movie that you missed the first time. So that, that ability, if you could do it, to offer a couple different times during the same week, teach the same curriculum each week, that allows that dancer to go back and forth. They can go both nights. If they can't make it Wednesday night, they can still be Saturday. It's just a better chance for you to get people through the, the learning part uh, quicker so they, so they get it. But you have to look at the composition of who you want to recruit and then set your dance time that fits best in their lifestyle. Okay, I've noticed there's a couple of other people that have unmuted themselves. Did you um, wish to speak? I'd like to say something. I'm from Powell River, BC. Um, we're in a, a coastal little community that you can only be reached uh, by ferry. Oh, so. wow. It's a disadvantage, and again, seniors, but I wanted you to know, Mike, that the weekend is Canadian. He is a Canadian performer. Yes, <laughs> okay, yes, he yeah. is. Yeah, so yeah. That, was a, that was a plus. And I, ac I, actually, I actually knew that. <laughs> I, okay. just figured, I just figured most people wouldn't have a clue what I was talking about when I said the weekend. Yeah, we love this show. Yeah, good. Um, another disadvantage we're finding uh, with Square Dance is the idea that's perceived as a couple. Okay. And again, the idea is how to market it and bring it in single people. And then we're also having to teach the uh, women. How to dance the man's part, yeah. Yeah, the man's part. So again, trying to um, market that aspect of bringing people in that it's not necessary for you to have a partner. So how do you deal with that? And then um, what was one of the other thoughts I had? Um, and then the idea too, it's got to be fun. A lot of the callers I find are so, they have to get through the teaching of all those tools that you walk in the door, you get in a group, and then you walk out. There's no time for the socialness for us to get to know each other. So that's something as a new president of the, our club that I'm really looking at is the fun, the socialness of it. And last um, March, I had planned a black light St. Patrick's Day dance and we couldn't have it because of yeah, the COVID. COVID. Everybody was so excited because again, one of the things is the, the crinolines, the way of dress. The first thing you mentioned to younger people is I would never do that I wouldn't wear those outfits. 
And we said, you don't have to. We right. don't tend to do that in our club. But I thought it'd be fun to have old time dance nights where it is for fun. Let's wear a crinoline. Let's do that. And that's why I thought with the black light, people could wear their crinolines and it'd be so fun to see them all lit up in black light. So, so I was trying to think of fun ways. So I, so I love the way that you're thinking. Um, I'll, I'll address the, the isolated island thing a little bit. Yeah. But you've really kind of addressed it yourself. Um, and I want to speak about some color lab initiatives. Um, just this year, within actually the last three months, uh, you know, color lab, the, the, the work that gets done at color lab is done in committees. And we just in the last three months set up, um, I'll probably get the exact name of the committee wrong, but it's, it's the social connection committee. So, you know, we've identified that we've been real busy doing all this other stuff and have lost track of how vitally it Im important it is that we get a social connection happening amongst our dancers, both current dancers, as well as beginners early into the stage as they're learning how to dance. So we've actually established um, a social connection committee. Uh, the chairman is Mike Seastrom and the vice chairman is David Mee. Uh, I know you probably know Mike. I don't know for sure if you know David, but he's, he's from Southern California, so you might. Um, and, and those guys have got a lot of great ideas. So there we're, and I'm a member of the committee. So we're working on kind of dusting off some of the old fun things that we used to do. Sometimes some of them we got to be a little more politically correct with, but we're working on some things so that we can provide education material to dancers and callers who want to and frankly need to incorporate the social aspect back into our dances. That's the glue. Yeah. You know, if you love, 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 love square dancing and you don't like any of the people that you dance with, yeah. you're not going to continue to square. Yeah. The glue is that social connection. So we're working on that. Um, in terms, and it sounds like you're working on that too. Mm -hmm. You, you talked about doing a black lights dance. So think about a black light dance in terms of that, um, merchandising thing that I talked about. So if you're going to do a black lights dance, you automatically are creating an atmosphere that's going to have something unique and special about it. Mm -hmm. The answers don't want to dance in the basement of the waste management building. Oh, yeah. I can I could just see you guys rolling your eyes in the back of your head. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I couldn't see you, but I mean it, the reaction is always the same. It's like, oh my God, what a PR marketing blunder. <laughs> yeah. But they didn't think about it. You know, they had, they didn't have big clubs. They didn't have lots of money. They just it's free. Great. We don't have to raise the dues. We don't have to raise, you know, but Honestly, we're we're competing, and, and believe me, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want us to be an expensive hobby at all. Okay. I don't, okay. but I do want us to be able to have enough money to operate our businesses in a business-like manner, and that means we're going to pay more. We just we just do. So that's my opinion. Okay, I would like to add a comment here. Okay. Um, as a, in the beginning, I mentioned a continuing series of marketing meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is next Thursday, and the topic there is specifically our image. So please attend that, come with your ideas, and yes, we need to change our image before we actually start putting it out there. It, this is my opinion. Before we start putting it out there for people to see, we need to change our image. So that's next Thursday at one o'clock. Okay. In regard to your image, uh, have any of you seen the research that Color Lab, Color Lab hired an organization called Starworks to do image um, research about, well, it's been a while. It's been uh, early, right around 2000. So it's, it's kind of old, but it's pretty accurate. Have any of you ever seen that, the report? I have, Mike. Uh, you're talking about Jim Hensley's uh, research right. company. Yeah, yes. wonderful. Wonderful. Do you have it? I I do have a, a transcript from a spoken presentation he did for one of our festivals in 2005. And um, if uh, the Turners are still on the system here, they did. They're up in Williams Lake, British Columbia. They did the actual transcript. Uh, right. Is is there a 
is there a, some other representation of what Jim? Yeah, there's a there's there's a whole research document that was actually not Jim. It was the it was the company that we hired to do it. Uh, let me dig around in my old files and see if I have it. I think I just have a printed version. But if I have a printed version, I got a nice scanner. I'll scan it, save it, and send it to you. Yes, I know please. Mike, I know Mike, he said that one of his initial conclusions was that our image is worse than we thought. And that was back in 2000, I think. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And it, it hasn't really changed. I don't, I don't yeah. know what we've done to change. I can tell you the arts, the arts in their, uh, in their uh, desire is, is great. You know, they came up with a new logo. Uh, and I know, I think you guys are all familiar with the new logo. Uh, they came up with a new slogan, which frankly they got from me. Uh, and there's a whole lot of, of information about why we went with Live Lively Square Dance. Um, and the idea was to put a new face on square dancing to develop a new image. Well, the challenge is that the only people that we're changing the image with is us. Yeah. Because we're not taking this information and marketing it out to all these people that don't square dance. Yeah. And I got to tell you guys, our activity will never get mass reach, never, yeah. because we're not the money. Okay, so um, we got to do the grassroots things. I have to make a comment here for those who do not know, the logo was originally designed by Nick Turner, a BC caller, his son. Oh, I forgot he was BC caller. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, and I believe he's attending tonight, but uh, any other questions? I'm wondering yeah. about, hey, oh. I, I've okay. got a question on music, but may we hear from the other person there? Yes. Yeah, uh, um, Paul Angel, I'm uh, from the mysterious east, Nova Scotia. Okay. Uh, it's interesting, uh, we had a, all our clubs on the South Shore of Nova Scotia failed, as happened in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. uh, about three years ago, my wife and I decided there was enough interest that we would try to get a club going again. We've had some minimum success. And I'll, I'll tell you some of the stuff that we did. And I've got a huge number of ideas from you today on marketing. Mm -hmm. thank, you, thank you for okay. the presentation. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm, I'm just going to say it one more time. Yeah. Get the marketing manual. Yeah. We, we actually, my wife was on the computer alongside of me reading Finding from it as you were doing your presentation. <laughs> and we're Mike, about to launch into an update what, on it. Mike, I'll can tell I you share a it on things here? that we did. One of the things we did was we made the approach of 10 lessons for 10 weeks or 10 weeks for $120. Pay up front. If you want to go further, you can go further. If not, if you, you can. Second thing we did, we threw out the square dance attire completely, totally casual. And um, strange as it would seem, a lot of the women that came in, even the younger ones, wanted to go back to the attire. You know, we never forced it. We just said square dance attire admired, but not required. And, I like that line. That's a great. Uh, well, line. that came from a, a caller out of the U.S. somewhere. It, it wasn't it wasn't our invention you didn't do that well, i love it i love it yeah. and, and like i said earlier my experience has been especially with uh with the ladies and with especially younger ladies the even middle-aged and I've, I've had some teenagers the the teenagers about the fourth night of class they went out and got dresses and started taking lessons in a square dance dress yes that, that so the image part is still an objective. So. The image is a, is a major problem for us. Now, here's, here's our experience with marketing. I'm in a very rural area, small town, 40,000 catchment area in a 40 kilometer area. Um, you go into Halifax, a city, uh, a medium sized city. If they market the way we do, they get absolutely nothing. If we market the way they do in Halifax, we get absolutely nothing. People still read newspapers out here. We can put an ad in the newspaper and pick up people. If they put an ad in the newspaper in Halifax, no one reads it. They have to go to a different media medium to do it. Uh, have, have you encountered that kind of stuff? 
sure. in, in BC or anywhere else for sure. that matter. Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, so primarily, uh, and I, I don't want to go too long on it, but yeah, you do have to look at at the market itself that you're marketing in. For example, um, if you want to use the newspaper, you, one, you can't build a brand using the newspaper. Newspaper is a read-only. At the most, you might get somebody to recognize the logo again if you do it over and over again. Newspaper is primarily a price and item. That's why the, the, the cars are in there, right? To use newspaper the best is if you can become friends with someone in their uh, in their off in their story writing side and get them to do a public uh, a public interest story about square dancing, people will read that as opposed to looking at an ad. Now, the second thing that you need to know about newspaper is that the vast majority of newspapers, as they were in the old days, old days being twenty years ago. Massive distribution, everybody got a physical paper that they hold in their hand and read. I can tell you, as soon as you drop somewhere between 60 and 50 years, the, the people that subscribe and pick up the daily newspaper falls off like a rock, okay? So if in your market, you wanna reach 60 year olds, chances are you can still reach them with a newspaper. If you wanna reach 30 years old, Nah, ain't gonna happen. So some of that has to do with rural lifestyles versus big city lifestyles. Um, the marketing manual has tons of information about digital tactics. Um, I know people think of iHeart, the company that I work for, as broadcast company, radio stations. And we are. We're the largest radio operator probably in the world, 865 broadcast radio stations, right? But the other side of our business is all about all of the digital stuff. And I can tell you that all of those things fit together. So, you know, a lot of people think that I'm the radio guy. Well, I am the radio guy. I'm also the Facebook guy. I'm also the, the video OTT guy, whatever that is. Uh, I'm all of those kinds of things. So the challenge is going to be, what is your market like? And who's the demographic that you want to reach? And then what, what methods do you use to reach them? So social media is huge right now, right? But when you put something out on social media, if you don't, if you don't pay Google to boost your post, it only goes to your friends. And most of your friends are very familiar with square dancing. And they either do or they don't, but you're not going to change that. So you posting some really cool stuff about your class coming up on your social media page is not going to do you much good because almost everybody that's your friend already knows all about it and they either are doing it or they didn't do it. Now, there's plenty of people that you haven't asked to square dance that you know. Um, and I'm not saying you, Paul, specific. In general, I'll just throw this out and I, I know it's out there. There are square dancers who, because of a bad image of square dancing, think their friends are going to laugh at them when they say they square dance or make fun of the activity. And rather than to educate them and invite them, they choose not to tell them about the activity for fear of being embarrassed. Good so, point. Nick. Get over it. You love it, it or you don't. That's exactly. Um, like I said, we have a series of meetings coming up and all this can be discussed. If you have any ideas, stuff you want to discuss at these meetings, please do. Um, okay. I believe, Brian, you had something you wanted to say. Hey, before before you jump in, Brian, um, I will send, I know Brian's kind of your liaison for all the marketing stuff. So Brian, I'll send you the updated deck that I went through today. You already have the Prairie Conclave speech I gave in 2008? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you have that. Um, so you're, you're absolutely free to share those with anybody that wants them. Uh, and if you guys find that you have specific topics that you'd like more information about, the last, pay, last line on that resources was me. Um, reach out. I'll be happy to share whatever I have. 
there there are a few things maybe better left for another time, Mike. I was wondering <laughs> about um, um, uh, music. We often say modern music is what we have, and I'm wondering if we should rather promote a wide variety or uh, many gen genres or non-traditional. Um, I don't know, Jean, did you want to entertain any more time or? Actually, um, that can be covered in the callers meetings. Um, Wednesday afternoons from 1 to 6 p.m. is an open house for callers and cures to drop in, uh, discuss things. I am setting up some workshops there um, okay. for, and if you have any top topics you want to cover, let me know, please. Um, my, ang my angle is promotionally when we do flyers and do media, well, how, what do we describe? How we describe the music? Uh, how we best describe the music. The other thought is uh, when we do demonstrations, exhibitions, what should the dance wear be? Should we um, avoid having any uh, traditional dance wear uh, in, in, in the local mall? Uh, that. <laughs> okay. There's, there's I, I would say, I would like to speak up at this point. I think we have an incredible opportunity just absolutely amazing opportunity people will want to travel and people will want to travel locally within the province within the state within the region and this is an incredible opportunity for all the small towns like williams lake prince george kamloops salmon arm you know all these little places to put on some kind of of um weekend getaway like the Starduster does in Powell River. We've been there several times and we just love going to Powell River. They have the just a wonderful caller, a wonderful time and the opportunity to not only square dance, but other activities as well. I don't care whether you like go salmon fishing, but you can en envelop a number of activities over a weekend not just square dancing and that is very attractive to a lot of people we know and as for our local area we've talked about exhibitions we've talked about decorating we've had some success with decorating and and we have several clubs here but we're all wondering where the future goes from this but we haven't put it all together We've done little bits and little pieces of it, but we just haven't brought it all together somehow or another for some reason. And I don't know why that is, but uh, yeah, we- Okay, these are all topics to discuss in ongoing meetings. Get in, get involved, get in the meetings and say this stuff and work together with the rest of the province. You know, we'll get it done. Um, I have shared the Color Lab Square Dance Marketing Manual in chat if anybody wants it. Um, and it looks like maybe Nick Turner has something he wants to say because he's unmuted. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I just, just some point of clarification on the Square Dance logo. It wasn't me that did anything about that. It was my son Your who son. lives in Oklahoma and my yeah. wife who lives with me. And they got <laughs> together and between them, they designed that logo. But my, my son did most of the graphics. Nice. Okay. okay. Nice. Tell him thank, thank you. you for us. So, Mike, I was supposed to uh, uh, kind of wrap up, and I just can't thank you enough. This has been uh, fabulous, and uh, I, I've got to uh, review uh, the um, video edition from USDA, and and we're recording this, so I'm going to go over it with a fine tooth comb. But everything is so valuable, and. Uh, we so much needed this, uh, even to just dabble initially. We, we've all got a lot to learn. So thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. Thank you for asking me, I appreciate it. In closing, I would like to thank you as well, Meg. Um, it was very educational. And um, I'm sure a lot of people will have more questions. Um, I don't know about them, but when I leave a meeting, I think of all the things that I could have said during the meeting. So I'm sure, if, well, as Mike said, that he's he's willing to answer any questions, Brian is available to answer questions, and so am I. Okay, so use the BC Federation. That's what we're here for. There is an events calendar on the page, which will tell you what topics we're covering in what week. 
Okay. Thank you everybody for attending. And Sunday is the second Mike meeting. Mike Hogan will be attending the second meeting. Tell your friends who were not able to make it today to check in because it's well worth it. Well, I'm glad you said that because in my head it was Saturday, not Sunday. So it's, <laughs> so it's Sunday. Oh, I better double check that. No, I'm sure it was Sunday at one o'clock. Sunday one o'clock, which is three where I live. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. We'll see thank you on the floor you. sometime. Thank you.